I'd now like to introduce Robert Skidelsky. Robert is a former professor of economics at Warwick University. He's a member of the House of Lords. Robert is best known for his award-winning biography of John Maynard Keynes and many other books about Keynes and his teachings. Uh, Robert, so you're going to tell us what you think about yesterday's budget. Uh, thank you, Patrick. Yes, the budget uh, has been dominated by two big spending pledges. Um, 30 billion um, to deal with the uh, coronavirus and 175 billion um, over five years um, um, uh, to uh, update our infrastructure, basically. And I want to say a word about both of those two things because I think they're important uh, th things to draw out from that. I mean, in connection with the, with the 30 billion stimulus, we heard language being used by the Treasury that um, hadn't really, we hadn't heard for about 40 years. In other words, the Chancellor acknowledged there had been a fall in demand uh, because people weren't going out to spend money and that the government's duty under those circumstances was to protect jobs. Now, the fall in demand is the language. I mean, there was a fall in demand, a huge fall in demand in 2008, 2010 in the crisis. But chancellors didn't use that concept and they didn't adopt policies of stimulus um, in order to meet the fall in demand. So this has been a change, this new language. We now have a Keynesian chancellor who talks about falls in demand which have to be offset by increases in government spending. But notice it's only for very exceptional circumstances. This is a natural disaster. It would be impossible uh, uh, for a chance to say. Now, the, 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 the good response, the proper response to a natural catastrophe is to cut government spending. Um, because, you know, people expect something very different. And yet, that was George Osborne's response to the disaster, not the natural disaster, but to the disaster of the great financial crisis. So, let, you know, I, let's hope that this um, marks the start of a rethink. Um, of, um, of, of how governments should actually respond to economic downturns. So that's the first point I'd like to make. The second point is about this 175 billion um, uh, uh, pound uh, program. I mean, why wasn't it started 10 years ago? Why is it only just started now? Um, we need it, everyone says we need it. Our infrastructure needs re restoring and improving. We need more R&D and so on. Why wasn't all this done 10 years ago? Ah, says the Chancellor, because we didn't have the fiscal space to do it 10 years ago. And now, as a result of you know, 10 years of wise and prudent conservative policy, i.e. I. austerity, we have the fiscal space. But that's nonsense. I mean, you know, that's a parody of an accountant's view uh, of government. I mean, take potholes. They, they, they've, they've allocated 2.5 billion to um, filling up 50 million potholes over the next five years. Well, either these potholes needed filling up or they didn't. If they did need filling up, why didn't we start filling them up 10 years ago? Why only now? And I think that's where um, we, we, we get into a problem because the government has never acknowledged that the austerity policy was a big mistake, that you never really suffer from lack of money. You, when you have lots of spare resources, you should do things and not say, well, we can't afford to because we haven't got the money. Um, you just do them and the money then um, actually comes back to you because there's more activity. Have they learned that lesson? I'm not sure they have. And this is my last point, uh, uh, really. And uh, uh, what, what, what's the state of fiscal rules now? I mean, what is the new fiscal constitution going to be? The Chancellor says, um, uh, we've got to rethink this. Everyone says that the existing fiscal rules uh, are a shred to pieces. The Chancellor says, well, we're going to think about what our new fiscal rules are going to be, and I'm going to tell you in the autumn. Well, I hope that they do a proper rethink and that they actually get to understand what a policy to protect jobs really means, not only in the short run, 
but over the long run. So we're betwixt and between the old, old regime and the new regime, but we don't know what the new regime is going to look like. It seems that the government has performed a massive U-turn and now says that it can borrow and spend as much as it needs to. It's not admitting that at all. It's just saying that um, we have uh, this temporary crisis, so we've got to do something, and that our austerity policy has given us the fiscal space to spend a lot of money now. But of course, that's rubbish. I mean, they had the fiscal space 10 years ago. I mean, and, and what's more, you have more fiscal space, actually, when you have lots of unemployed resources, when they're, you know, people and, 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 and plant is unemployed, you then have spare resources in the economy. That's when you ought to start doing things. Um, uh, and borrowing was very cheap then as well. Um, so I think uh, they haven't, no, the answer is they haven't acknowledged their mistake, and until they do, I, I'm a bit sceptical about how far the rethinking will go. It seems that the influence of the Treasury on economic policy is now to be diminished because Downing Street appears to have taken control of the Chancellor. Is that a good thing? Do you think that in the past the Treasury had too much influence and it was too cautious? It's a step. Yes, Boris Johnson um, wanted something you know, more active, a more, more active person at the Treasury, um, and to give the Treasury also a kick up the backside. Um, and this may happen, but it's con it, the, the problem is conceptual. You have to actually rethink um, what was wrong with austerity policy. And until you've done that rethinking, you're not going to get a permanently improved um, fiscal policy. You know, people now say, well, fiscal policy ought to be more active. That's a revolution in itself, but it's only just started. Just appointing a new chancellor isn't going to, isn't going to achieve the revolution. But I, I see a huge U-turn here. They're now saying that we can borrow to spend, and there isn't really a particular limit if we need to do that spending. But that's a completely different way of thinking from the last 10 years, isn't it? Well, they say it because they, they believe that um, uh, it's, uh, well, first of all, it, it was a pledge. In, they won an election on, on um, the Conservatives won an election on a pledge to spend more, especially in the, in, in the northern uh, bits of the country. And they're now, they're now delivering on this pledge. But people have always promised to spend more for political reasons. Um, what we want is a promise to um, arrange your taxes and spending for intellectually reputable reasons. I mean, one of the things we've hardly begun to consider is, is, is if you suddenly uh, have a huge stimulus, um, not at the bottom of the cycle, but when you're actually near the top of a cycle, um, you do run into problems of inflation. I mean, Keynes, Keynes said that. We do risk some inflationary uh, 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 pressure if we spend on this scale. Now, I, I'm, I don't want to overemphasize that, but it just, it just shows that you can't just switch stimulus spending on and off um, in order to uh, fulfill election pledges. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's not the way to run a policy. I'd like to ask you about fiscal rules. Now, yesterday, the government said that it was abandoning the current fiscal rule and would let us know in a few months' time what it wants to replace it with. Do you think that we need fiscal rules? And if so, what do you think the fiscal rules should say? I think we do need fiscal rules because otherwise you um, give too much scope to discretion. Remember, what, what, what the great reaction against Keynesian policy came in the 70s because they thought governments were simply um, inflating the economy um, in order to, you know, win elections. You know, they talked about the political business cycle. And I don't think politicians should be given complete discretion. Um, because, I mean, they, they, they'll, they'll mess up and they'll do things for short-run political reasons. Therefore, I do want a certain degree of automaticity. And I think one principle ought to be that you regard capital spending as a continuous flow 
of spending into the economy, which should be independent of the business cycle. You need, you need certain infrastructure, the demand for it grows with the growth of the economy, and you keep that spending going. You don't cut it the moment um, there's, a, there's a, a recession. So that's the first thing, and that will be a very important smoothing uh, mechanism. Secondly, you need to make um, your um, counter-cyclical spending, your short-run spending variations, as automatic as possible. And that's why I hope that government will give serious consideration to the idea of a public sector job guarantee, which is be uh, for the government to be a lender of the, uh, sorry, an employer of the last resort. So that when unemployment um, grows, you, 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 you're, you're guaranteed, people want, wanting work are guaranteed a public sector job. So the pool of public sector jobs expands and contracts automatically with the business cycle. And it's a very powerful boost to what are called the automatic stabilizers. And it's something that should be as automatic as possible. So it's not up to the politicians to decide when to increase their spending and when to reduce it. OK, now some people will say that the Chancellor flunked the budget yesterday in relation to the climate emergency. Do you agree that much more should have been done in this budget? to deal with the consequences of climate change? No, I think, I think he rose to that challenge. Uh, I mean, I think he did what... We don't know really how serious the challenge of the virus is going to be, what effects it's going to have uh, on, 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 on the economy, and what, what, what financial steps ought to be taken to mitigate its impact. Um, to, but to go back to your earlier question, I had thought of one thing I would do if I had been Chancellor, I would have started looking at um, public sector job guarantee, whether, whether one could, whether one could um, get, get, get the framework for that established. I would have started looking at the idea of um, a universal citizen's income, um, none of which is both of which were recommended by the Labour, Labour Party, advocated by them, but none of them is in, is, is in the current plan. So I would have done more to prepare for the long term, um, and, and, and I would have probably done more, um, I think, uh, on the climate change question. But, you know, I mean, this is far from saying these are the policies I would have adopted. Has that been tried uh, and been successful in, in any other economy? Curiously enough, it was actually pledged by European Prime Ministers in 1997. They said they, would, um, they wanted the European Union to offer job or training guarantee. That is a guaranteed job or training. All the Prime Ministers agreed. It was never done except by Denmark, did a, something along those lines, Holland has done something along those lines, and Hungary, interestingly enough, Hungary has uh, implemented a, a public sector job guarantee. Um, it's been advocated extensively by the democratic, the left Democrats in the United States. So I think its time has come, and it would be revolutionary, because if you really did that, if you really made the state employer of the last resort, for the first time since the Industrial Revolution, you will have abolished unemployment in a free society. No more unemployment. Wow. That, that would be an amazing thing. So uh, finally, can I ask you what are you most disappointed about yesterday's budget? Well, the lack of, the lack of um, any evidence of um, uh, uh, thinking about what an appropriate Keynesian constitutional uh, fiscal framework would be like, lack of any evidence of thinking about that, and lack of any uh, sort of interest in some of these innovative ideas um, for, for um, uh, uh, employment um, and um, uh, how to deal with automation. Uh, things of that kind, which are all, and, and climate change, 
all issues which are looming up but we have to start thinking very seriously about it, and the Treasury has to start thinking very seriously about it, as well as other departments. So the spending taps are being turned on, but there doesn't seem to be an overarching theory or plan of where they're going. No, no, no conceptual framework. Yeah. It's not there. And there's too little evidence that it's being prepared. Right. I think we can say that austerity has been abandoned and they no longer support it as an economic policy. But we had 10 years of austerity and that caused untold suffering to the poorest and most vulnerable people in the country. We've had an increase in poverty, insecurity, uh, early death, suicide, reduced life expectation, child po poverty. Do you think that the government should be apologizing to those people who have suffered most from austerity? Well, I'm not, you know, a great fan of apologies, I'm afraid. But I am a great fan, I'm a great supporter of acknowledgement. Acknowledgement we were wrong, and there's an implicit apology in that. But to say I apologize to the British people, I don't believe in but those sort of things. your conclusion from yesterday's announcement surely uh, implicitly accept that austerity didn't work and was a mistake? No. They don't implicitly accept it. They explicitly said it did work. And, the, and because it worked, we now have fiscal space to do these things. But that's absolute rubbish, isn't it? Well, I think it's rubbish, but it's not an acknowledgement of a fault. <laughs> Thank you very much, Robert Skidelsky, for your comments on the 2020 budget. Mm -hmm.